Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Namrata Kapoor, a Senior Consult Consultant, Indian Institute for Human Settlements, and I'm the moderator for the session today on mapping change, planning as method, knowledge, and technique. I welcome you all, and I welcome our panelists. Uh, we have uh, CNRS Research Director, Professor Lorraine Kennedy, uh, Prashant Chakrabarti, doctoral candidate at University at Gothenburg, uh, Saurabh Popli, Associate Professor at SPA Bhopal, uh, and Chandra, who is from the CMR University School of Architecture. Uh, we look forward to your papers, uh, and over to you, Lorraine. Thank you, Namrata. I'm going to share my screen. Right. Well, um, thank you very much to the organizers. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, this is a very famous conference, and um, I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, so just briefly, um, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, you can't hear. OK, move that a little bit closer. Is that better? Yeah? Um, so I'll be talking about uh, um, a socio-spatial uh, and comparative approach to uh, urbanization processes. And um, so I'll, I'll start out just by positioning a little bit the topic in um, the academic debates and then present the, this approach, this interdisciplinary approach, which was developed uh, collaboratively with, um, with colleagues um, from, from many different places. Um, and then I'll uh, talk about the results from a uh, kind of a pilot or test um, study that we did, a comparative study. And then in the last part, I'd like to talk about uh, ongoing research in Chennai. Um, so first thing is to acknowledge um, my uh, collaborators and, and colleagues. Um, so this approach that I'll be talking about was actually developed in a research consortium um, we started working on it, this about five or six years ago. Um, and then um, just about six months ago, um, this, this joint paper came out in regional studies and um, where we talk about this approach and we actually apply it to three different cases. Um, I'd like to say if any of you um, do not have access to regional studies, uh, please just send me an email. I'd be happy to send you a, a PDF. And also, these are my uh, collaborators in, in Chennai. So the topic is uh, urbanization processes in the global south. Um, this is in the context uh, of the, the southern turn in urban studies. Um, Jenny Robinson spoke very eloquently about this in her keynote last night, this, uh, this, this southern turn. Um, the call for, for theory building from the South uh, and specifically um, from Asia and Africa, which are the, the sites of, of the most rapid urbanization um, across the planet. So some of the key debates, um, many of you will be very familiar with these, uh, planetary urbanization, um, which, is, which is a very influential body of, of work and which continues to to generate some, some really um, important uh, kind of, uh, of results. Um, it's also sparked, I think, uh, a lot of conversations. And um, we can think of subaltern urbanization, agrarian urbanism, two examples which are very relevant uh, in part because they really rely on the Indian case and are, are, are rooted in the Indian case. And, and they've become, and I think that's, that's going to increase even further in the years ahead, uh, an important part of the debate about um, urbanization in, in the global south and urbanization generally. And there's also the body of literature peripheral urbanization, um, which I'll be engaging with uh, specifically. Um, uh, Teresa Caldera is one of the people uh, who has, uh, I think, helped contribute to thinking about this so-called problem space um, and why are we interested in the periphery or why is it important? Um, well, these are 
sites of very rapid expansion. Um, they're, they're sites of um, speculation. We were hearing about speculation in the last panel, uh, contestation, but also hopes and aspirations. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that urban peripheries are the new frontier, um, not only of urbanization, but, but theory building as well. Um, but the, there are a lot of challenges to studying the peripheries because change is so rapid. And uh, you know, so how do you sort of go about doing this? And so with this collective, we developed a, something we call a socio-spatial analytics so it's an approach that, that tries to integrate in a very systematic way um, you know, methods from the geosciences, so remote sensing, you know, spatial metrics, uh, spatial analyses, with qualitative research, including you know, fieldwork-based kind of you know, micro uh, studies. And this is, this is very interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, in part because there are tensions between these disciplines in their assumptions and in their, um, you know, their their epistemologies, and and so some of that tension, you know, between a positivist kind of approach and a more interpretive approach, um, are some of the things that we grapple with. Um, so to to operationalize this, um, so what we decided to do was to, you know, we developed this approach. And then we wanted to test it um, on, on three cases. And you know, we, you know, building on, on the debates and the, and the literature on um, comparative urbanism, um, we decided to focus on some lenses, a pair of lenses, fragmentation, integration, connectivity, and bypass. And we, we developed these lenses because they have meaning both spatially and socially. Um, you know, we can talk about fragmentation. You can use spatial metrics to measure fragmentation, for instance. Um, but fragmentation also has, uh, in, you know, you can talk about institutional fragmentation. You can talk about social processes that fragment. So, so we, you know, we, we decided we'd sort of integrate these into a framework and, um, and then, you know, look at how, uh, you know, systems of, land governance also you know are part of this equation of of creating fragmentation how economic development policies uh, also um, uh, translate into uh, you know spatial manifestations and um, so anyway I, I don't want to dwell too long on this um, on this because it's all in the paper for one thing um, but it's just to give you sort of an idea of the approach um, that we're also then trying to use in, in Chennai so here, of course, this is what we call an a posteriori uh, comparison. This, this research had been already conducted um, not using this approach. And then, um, and then we tried to sort of see you know, how we could mobilize it and, and use it. So we start with a kind of a, a spatial footprint. So this is, of course, the kind of temporal spatial trajectories of these metropolitan um, cities. And, we selected sites within these metropolitan regions to study more specifically. So for, for Delhi, it was Faridabad and uh, Lingang in Shanghai and Kasoa in, in Accra. Um, so just some of, quickly, some of the takeaways is that, um, you know, peri-urban areas uh, in the global south do not demonstrate sort of uniform morphologies. Um, there are you know, more kind of neat, more neatly planned sort of, uh, if you think of like the Shanghai case, um, or more kind of fragmented plot by plot development. So, so the morphologies are definitely of heterogeneous. Um, and, and in each case, you know, we, we were able to sort of uh, situate them within their kind of broader political economic you know, context and, and the planning norms and all of these things that, that contribute to those, those morphologies. Um, we also realized that, you know, depending on the scale of analysis, you could have, you know, dissonance. You could have a, 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 an impression or a, a general sort of pattern of, say, integration, uh, but at more finer grain uh, scales, you, you could have, you know, degrees of fragmentation. 
Um, so despite this kind of heterogeneity that we, that we observed, um, we did find that across cases, there were three um, processes that, that really appeared critical. Um, so, and I think this, they're quite intuitive uh, to a degree. Um, of course, market and speculation-driven property development processes. We were talking about that in the last panel. And, and in all of our cases, um, these trend toward uh, kind of, uh, there's a lot of housing, of course, in property development, and they trend toward upper and, and middle class residential spaces. But for each case, it, it, it very much depends on the you know, historically grounded uh, land politics. And, and this very much influences the distribu distributional pattern. Um, State-led development strategies are also extremely important. Um, it looks like time's running out, so I'm going to <laughs> speed through this. And of course, you know, governance arrangements. So in Chennai, um, you know, we're building on knowledge that we have of the city from past projects. Um, we, what we're doing, though, is that we're doing the spatial analysis right now in order to help us, you know, select the sites for comparison. And um, we have three focuses, you know, the spatial, besides the spatial is socioeconomic change and the environmental kind of uh, engagement. And, you know, so we're, we're, we're looking at the expansion of the built up area. We're not looking at administrative areas, you know, per se, initially. Um, we're just trying to see, you know, what is this kind of organic growth? And, um, and then we're trying to characterize that, characterize all the, the, the peripheries around this core area starting from 1985. So that's what this map shows. And this is, this is you know, just uh, hot off the press. Um, this is just from last week um, that it was finalized. But this is, the boundary shows the current uh, metropolitan area. Um, so just very quickly, we're mapping the infrastructure geographies, um, which, are, which are very you know, powerful drivers. We're, we're looking at industrial geographies. Um, we're struggling with how to integrate the service industry because you know, of data issues. I mean, all of you who work on Indian cities know how difficult it is to get, to get data. And when you're trying to you know, use a geographical information system, uh, you, you've got to work with data. And so we're, we're doing what we can, piecing together different things. I'd, I'd be happy to come back to that in the discussion. I just want to point out one really interesting thing that we're also looking at is how, uh, you know, local finance is right. So I'm out of time, um, and I, I'd like to come back to this, but how villages, panchayats who are outside the municipality, you know, how their, um, well, their finances and their um, their governance has really been uh, completely, in some cases, completely. Um, changed by, by where they happen to be vis-a-vis -vis, um, major infrastructure. Um, so I'll just leave the challenges slide up there and, and, and stop there. These are some of the things we're grappling with right now. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, um, thank you for that presentation. Actually, I was thinking about uh, the idea of comparison and periphery as a method. And uh, I was wondering if there's value in comparing uh, peripheries not just through space but also across time and through time and so I was thinking about uh, you know what I mean by that is not just think about peripheries as uh, you know post-independence peripheries post-industrial post-liberalization peripheries but also peripheries that appear and disappear and how long does it take for a periphery to disappear and what does it even mean when a periphery disappears how do you decide that the periphery has is no longer a periphery and so I was just thinking about that as a comparative uh, method. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and I'll uh, move on to Prashant now. Uh, uh, Prashant is online. Yeah. Hi, Namita. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, there we go. Can you just tell me quickly uh, how much time I have? Is it uh, 10 minutes or 15? Uh, you have 12 minutes. I have 12 minutes. Perfect. 
All right. So, uh, good morning. It's it's still morning here in Gothenburg. A very rainy morning. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and at IHS for this conference. Uh, my presentation is titled City is Method. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a set of reflections, uh, particularly on, on what kind of methods one needs to devise to study, uh, to study the urban, especially the flows and fluxes of, of urban spatial temporality, as I call it. Uh, in, in particular, my project, my doctoral project, is an anthropological study of uh, public transport in Mumbai, Mumbai's local trains. Uh, and ethnographically, I most of my research was grounded on the study of repair and maintenance. Uh, but my study also utilized autoethnography as a commuter. So what I was really interested in is, is to think about public transport as a kind of an interface. And from the perspective of those who repair and maintain these trains, but also from the perspective of those who travel and commute on these trains. Uh, so in that respect, I, I have a kind of a post-human science and technology studies uh, approach in addition to, to urban studies and also repair studies. Uh, I, I want to start with a few reflections or questions, uh, particularly uh, Lorraine had a reference to planetary urbanization and, and I'm quite fascinated by that. Uh, especially because it raises a lot of interesting uh, methodological uh, and epistemic uh, challenges. Uh, and, and my point of departure is, of course, this, this critique of metho methodological citizen. And I think the kind of, you know, what we've been hearing about peripheries kind of, I, I think, contributes to that because we're trying to critique this naturalization uh, of the city. And instead, uh, we're, we're trying to locate cities and urbans within this 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 planetary framework or this framework of expansion. Uh, and what from, from the side of urban anthropology, uh, what I'm also interested in is this debate about, uh, a debate that started in the 80s, for instance, about whether urban anthropology could be considered anthropology. And indeed, there are many who, who do think that it is anthropology. But how do we also study cities? How do we study cities as uh, epistemic and analytic kind of entities. And, and the way I use city as method draws on uh, Mizadra and Nielsen's uh, very influential book. I think it was published about 10 years ago called Potter is Method. Uh, at the same time, I'm also embedded in the, and, and I'm also kind of drawing from uh, the mobility turn in, in geography, particularly this critique of sedentarist uh, metaphysics, this, this kind of a sedentary bias that looks at the urban, you know, just in terms of, you know, settlements and infrastructures and so on. But I'm more interested in in how how the urban is actually a set of flows and, and public transport is, of course, a, a fascinating way to, to look at that. Uh, I won't spend much time on on Mumbai's kind of local trains, except, uh, you know, for the for for the fact that uh, when when we consider public transport to be something like the lifeline of the city, uh, you know, it it. It, it has two sets of meanings. Uh, primarily, one is is the infrastructural kind of meaning about moving people through space and kind of compressing time and and how Should we move on to the next panelist and then come back? Or, 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 but we've just started, so. Prashant, can you hear us? Are you here? No, yeah, yeah, he's not on, online. Um, all right, what we'll do is uh, we'll move on. Uh, Saurabh, are you here? Is Saurabh online? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Saurabh, sorry to put you in the spot before time, but uh, <laughs> we can begin with your paper and then come back. Thanks. All right. Uh, 
Thank you. I want to thank IIHS and uh, uh, Professor Kennedy for his excellent, for her excellent presentation. Am I audible? Am I clearly audible? Yes, you're audible. Right, thank you. I, uh, my paper is titled Cartographic Absences and Statutory Application. Are you able to see it clearly? Uh, yes, but if you could put it in the presentation mode, that would be better. Is this better? Is it better? Uh, uh, can you see my full screen? Presentation mode. It will, it will come to the full screen. I, think. I did do that. Uh, just let me know when it, when it comes on full screen, please. So I'm interested actually in the in 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 not just what the master plan does, uh, not just what the master plan is, but also what it does, uh, as opposed to what it says it, it does. Uh, has my presentation started, please? Has it started full screen? The presentation hasn't started. You'll have to share the screen, the presentation screen. I'll do that again. I'll do that again. I think it hadn't hasn't started. Let me start it again. Please give me a second. Is it on full screen mode now? No, it isn't. Maybe you can just increase the size and that'd be fine. Okay. We can all see it, so you can just move on. That's fine. Right, right. So I'm looking at Bhopal, and I'm looking at um, particularly urban rivers in the context of Bhopal. We've uh, Bhopal is a presentation. Sorry about this. We've lost your presentation. You have? Oh. You're not projecting your screen right now. Right. Is it visible now? Yes. Is it visible now? Yes. So I'm interested in Bhopal. Bhopal is right in the center of India, as you all know, and it's also a very interesting landscape. It's very interesting from a variety of perspectives, but also because it sits at actually a a subcontinental ecotone. Uh, it's a place where you know three different ecotones come in and uh, and they and they come very close to each other. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, it's it's a place where grasslands sort of come and meet uh, teak and mixed forests. And what this does is that it results in a beautiful uh, mosaic, uh, a landscape mosaic, uh, which is incredible for its diversity. It's also interesting that it sits actually on a peninsular water divide uh, between the north flowing, north and east flowing Indo Gangetic rivers and uh, Gangetic rivers and tributaries and the uh, southern, eastern flowing and western flowing, uh, you know, eastern flowing, uh, western flowing Narmada. Uh, so, what it does, what the climate does, uh, we have a monsoonal climate, and what it does is that it creates this incredible diversity in the landscape uh, uh, across the seasons. Uh, and what that also does is that it also uh, has an implication of the water quality uh, in those streams. Uh, so we have incredible landscape diversity. We also have incredible uh, seasonal diversity. Uh, but when we look at the city, uh, it's really a city like uh, like many others, except that you know it's not nearly as busy as uh, uh, Bangalore or Delhi, but it still exhibits a very dense, compact urbanism and an urban form. Uh, and the large green open spaces that you do see are actually institutions. So uh, there is a fair bit of open space that's still in the city, and that's very interesting because it also has implications on the behavior of uh, urban streams and rivers. And, uh, and yet those streams are now increasingly under threat. Um, there are uh, a lot of pressures from, uh, from a dense urbanism, uh, a lot of pressures for development, and uh, so we see a lot of um, streams and rivers now, um, you know, starting to exhibit the same sorts of problems that we see uh, at a subcontinental scale across India. So uh, streams, what were erstwhile streams and uh, channels and rivers have now become, uh, you know, uh, drainage uh, channels. And uh, in, in the master plan, for the most part, they're called nalas. So today I'd like to also, uh, in, uh, you know, together with you, look at some of those things that, um, some of the semantics of uh, the master plan and what does it mean really when it says river and what does it really mean when it says Nala 
And we look at it from uh, three perspectives. One, the perspective of what science says, what the science is, what the latest science is. Second, the perspective of what the latest planning guidance is. And the third, um, very briefly, perhaps from what, uh, you know, what it, what it needs to mean in terms of a, of a larger civic sense. Uh, we are at a place where uh, our risks are increasing. We are, um, you know, uh, almost at the top of the table in terms of risks uh, as compared to other states in India. And yet there have been calls from informed uh, observers, uh, and this is true for many places in India, but equally for Bhopal, because Bhopal has uh, also experiencing urban flooding. So it has this twin uh, problem. It has a conundrum that on the one hand, it experiences droughts and extreme water scarcity, and on the other hand, it also experiences floods, which is strange considering that it's actually on a plateau. So Bhopal sits about 500 meters above sea level, and it's on a plateau and it's surrounded by hills. And the interesting contradiction is that it's still prone to flooding. So one must wonder why that is the case. Why, does it, why is it still prone to flooding? And then if you look deeper, we'll, we find that the answers are in the usual places. The master plan talks about streams, but doesn't show many. Uh, it only shows about 15 kilometers length of, of rivers, and only two rivers marked uh, in a planning area which in 2031 is expected to be of the order of about 1,000 square kilometers. Uh, two rivers, uh, 15 square kilometers length, 15 kilometers length in a planning area that's 1,000 square kilometers is, uh, is something that should make us sit up and wonder. So I'm going to only look at, we've examined 13 wards in uh, Bhopal city to examine, uh, to look at what uh, is the fate of and what can perhaps be the fate of uh, through enlightened planning of the rivers or, uh, in different wards. But I will first start with some vignettes. So this is a typical river. It's a it's a important river. It's called the Halali. It doesn't yet figure in an important way in, a, uh, in the master plan, in the development plan, but in the 2031 draft development plan, it is very much an urban river. And yet, when you look at it, you find that there is incredible biodiversity. Uh, there are numerous uh, species of birds, of um, ground covers, of grasses, different species, crustaceans, and yet uh, the river doesn't always flow. So, for example, now the river takes on the form of pools of water. It doesn't really have a base flow. Uh, or rivers or streams in, in Bhopal don't really have, uh, have a very pronounced base flow through the air. Uh, so what does that mean that they're not rivers? Uh, uh, the master plan seems to think, the de development plan seems to think that they aren't rivers, they're, these are streams, and uh, it uses the term uh, nala, which means actually a sewer, a drain, a drainage area. What you see on your screen right now is one of the main tributaries of the largest man-made lake in India, and one of the largest in Asia. Uh, with a catchment area of 361 square kilometers. The upper lake in Bhopal is, uh, you know, at full tank level is well over 30 square kilometers. And uh, we looked at its catchment and we, what we saw is that uh, it's increasingly under urban pressure. In many places, it's just the, you know, the river is reduced to uh, a culvert. Um, it has been built over. Uh, the, natural, the natural edges are still intact for the most part because urban development hasn't reached there. But in other parts like the Barkatola University area uh, in the southern part of Bhopal, you find that the roads have started to encroach on uh, the riverbed and the river is for the most part uh, tightly packed under culverts and, uh, you know, is, is uh, and this is also an open area on the right side because it's still a university and the university isn't well developed. But what we do see is a really uneven development. What we see is an uneven uh, urban form uh, in places very compact, in places there is no river, there are no signs of river. And the reason, and uh, to look a little further, we would see that actually the course of the river has been channelized. And these channels uh, do a lot of, they alter the character and the, and the um, nature of the river. And this is, um, this is argued in, in more detail elsewhere. I don't have the time to go into all those things, except that, uh, you know, from a range of perspectives, this is a problem. Uh, there are problems when we, when we uh, channelize the river, for example, when the hyperic zone of the river, which sustains the 
uh, aquatic life, which sustains amphibians, crustaceans, invertebrates, and also many kinds of floristic species. Is uh, they are all lost. Uh, also, um, concrete uh, channelizations prevent uh, the the lateral movement of species of all of species. So many species can't, uh, you know, their life cycles are uh, are are affected. Uh, not to mention the addition of sewerage and other kinds of solid waste in those channels. And these are channels that we have studied in the northern part of Bhopal. Uh, you know, hope that uh, there'll be a in in my paper. I'm discussing it in more detail. Uh, this is only to show you the the kinds of um, uh, disjunctures. Uh, that happen when uh, channelization is done um, by, uh, you know, by poorly thought design. And uh, so then when we look at it, on the one hand, we see these extremely rich in terms of biodiversity environments, though there is no base flow. And on the other hand, we see a uh, base flow, but that is mainly carrying sewerage. Uh, so the question then really begins, uh, we really need to ask ourselves, that what is our imagination of a river? and that whether our imagination of the river in fact meets the reality. So often reality is far more complex than, uh, you know, than theory, and theory tends to smoothen out its rough edges, and which, which prompts us to, uh, to inquire into what, uh, in what ways does the theory need to be, uh, does it need to be uh, you know, more sensitive? So when we look at the uh, development plan 2031, it mentions four rivers, out of which two rivers only in this pass through the uh, urban development plan. Uh, but, and therefore, and uh, you know, it mentions some lakes and some uh, protected, it recommends protection around the stream edges. But when we look at it more deeply, we find in fact that the whole place is, uh, is dissected with, uh, with water courses and um, so, for example, in this development plan, we superimpose the development plan on top of the Google Earth image, and we found that uh, there is no provision for urban streams, uh, for streams and, uh, you know, riparian corridors at all. Uh, and that's why they look like this. Uh, this is the Patra River, which in fact is the historical river that, uh, you know, used to drain from the upper lake, uh, from the lower lake. And it was a it's a very important river uh, for the region, but in this development plan, which is then superimposed on the Google Earth image, you see actually no no definition of the river at all, uh, which leads us to ask that what is the theory that this planning uh, uh, that this development plan really bases itself on, and if we were to inquire in that direction, we find that in fact there's a there's a whole new science uh, that is now available to us as um, you know, uh, as planners, if we wanted to understand the nature of our rivers, the problem is that when we think of a river, we think of a perennial river because in North India and in many other parts of India, which in which there is a pronounced, um, you know, which are either glacial fed or which are from moist climes, there are perennial flows. But in Central India, in peninsular parts of peninsular India and in Western India, uh, the climate is a lot drier. And the landscape is, uh, you know, is higher. It has more relief, and therefore the rivers aren't really perennial. They can't be imagined in the same way. Uh, so this, uh, the science of uh, what I call intermediate intermittent rivers and ephemeral streams, is a new science. is still developing science, which then begins to tell us that this, in fact, we need to reevaluate our rivers and streams. We don't understand them, and uh, uh, from the Sorry. scientific perspective, we yes. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't hear that. Sorry. Uh, we are Were you saying to, something? Uh, if I may request you to... Out of time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I take a minute or should I stop? Um, you can, can take I? a minute to conclude, yeah. All right. I'll take a minute to conclude. All I'm saying, uh, all I wanted to uh, uh, bring your attention to is that from the science perspective, our development plans do not understand these rivers at all. And therefore, they hugely undercalculate, underestimate the amount of, uh, or the, uh, you know, the sheer uh, volume of water that is passing through. And because, uh, and there's, uh, you know, they, what they term as rivers are in fact not, are only the fifth order or sixth order streams. In fact, the, uh, the river network that we computed was in the order of, uh, you know, almost 
a thousand uh, kilometers, just the fifth and fourth order streams. So uh, this, uh, from, the, from the science perspective, I'd like to argue that there is no science available to us that should help us uh, or to, we should help guide our development plans better. Even from the perspective of the um, river-centric urban plans, uh, river-centric urban planning and the uh, river-centric urban management plans that the National Institute of Urban Affairs has recommended, planning guidance does exist on how, how development plans ought to be more sensitive to uh, urban rivers. So with this, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much. I hope uh, I'd be able to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Um, thank you for you know uh, helping us think about the shifting geography of hydrology and uh, imagine fixed geography of a master plan, uh, a development plan, um, and um, I, I, you know it, it did make me think about like uh, those, especially those maps and how crucial they become in mapping something like a you know the rep the role of representation in uh, sort of like mapping the micro shed you know which becomes so crucial to urban flooding but seldom gets caught because it's either the real macro level map that you're seeing uh, or you're seeing you know a development plan and, and that meso scale of mapping the micro shed does not sort of exist uh, as a planning practice right now and um, thank you thank you for that uh, is prashant back up uh, prashant can we ask you to go next uh, yeah do you want me to carry on yeah. from where uh, unfortunately I... Might be helpful. Yeah. yes i'll just start sharing my screen um, right. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Uh, can you? Yeah. Um, so I think I'll I'll just stay with some reflections uh, for right now. Uh, the the first one is 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 with regard to maintenance and uh, what my research has been kind of really focusing on is how. The, the maintenance of infrastructures is deeply implicated in how uh, urban spatial temporal rhythms are kind of produced. Uh, and, and of course, a main challenge of this methodologically is uh, when, when you are looking at workers who are repairing cranes, you're, it's very hard to discern exactly uh, how those interventions are responsible for, for you know, the trains actually on the tracks. And, and vice versa. So there is this very hard interface that separates the world of maintenance from the world uh, of infrastructures that 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 people and commuters and the public generally kind of inhabit. Uh, so that's been this one kind of main methodological uh, uh, challenge, uh, right? Of, of how do you how do you study the relation between uh, maintenance and and uh, urban space? And and of course, it it becomes very apparent when trains do break down. When, when trains, uh, whether it's a fault or whether it's a kind of failure, uh, you know, the way a, a closed circulatory network kind of, you know, just stops functioning. Uh, so that, that is a very profound nature of breakdowns. So, so breakdowns then are a way to, to, to start studying these, these entanglements. Um, so so that's, that's where I'm quite interested in this uh, idea of, of interfaces. And as, as a commuter, what I'm also interested in is looking at how these spaces are not neutral. These are spaces that are inhabited by, uh, or, or spaces where people, commuters produce conviviality, uh, but these are also spaces that reproduce divisions of class and gender, and, and particularly uh, di disability, because uh, our public infrastructures, unfortunately, are, not, are still not very accessible. Uh, so it's, this is also an interesting way of then studying uh you know who who gets to access the city who is part of these these circular rhythms and so on so so when i use city as method as a kind of heuristic as a kind of way of of framing these questions i i i take seriously what in science and technology studies is known as infrastructural inversion right you 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 look at the hidden uh, backstage of these infrastructures you look at what happens when uh, these infrastructures are maintained, uh, and and when they break down, and and what and and how these become vital and important uh, for people when when they're using them, and and how that is related to urban scale as well. Um, so so I I want to conclude with because I uh, 
uh, a lot of my co-panelists here are talking about uh, planning as well. So I wanted to kind of, uh, I am not a planner. I, I don't, I haven't worked with planners. I've mostly worked with uh, engineers and and they are also situated very curiously in this 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 kind of model of planning and bureaucracy uh but there there has been a very interesting anthropological dialogue with planning as as uh, james holson wrote writes in in a recent volume uh anthropology and planning are about investigating the present uh and and i i, I want to conclude with some questions about uh what what it means for these infrastructures to be accessible to the public how do we account for the public when planning for transport um i'm not i'm not sure if if many are aware but there there have been recent protests in uh, mumbai against these air conditioned uh trains which not only have uh higher fares than non air conditioned trains uh but these trains also disrupt these spatial temporal rhythms and then and 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 the protests that have kind of taken place are are articulations of you know the access accessing the city through public transport so the public question in public transport uh, but also the the kind of differential produ production of, of mobility and 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 also how it's entangled with questions of, of class and ident of class identity particularly so so those are some some kind of reflections I want to conclude with. Uh, so yeah, I'll I'll stop uh, my presentation there. Thank you, thank you, Prashant. Um, you know, I, I actually, I was thinking about uh, my friend once telling me that her biggest nightmare was falling asleep in a Mumbai local and ending up at the repair shed. <laughs> you know, uh, like this, this geography that none of us sort of access uh, in Bombay, and it's the secret geography that you see while you're traveling on local trains and you see see yeah. you know the repair sheds on the way. Um, I was wondering uh, if you, uh, in your ethnographic accounts, did you even travel with the people who repaired the local trains, you know, like sort of bringing the two spaces of, you were talking about the user and the fixer being two di distinct categories and um, what what was that account like? So that was one question. That yeah. Um, yeah, uh, very quickly, that was the inspiration for this project because I traveled with a lot of people who who, who were in the railways and that's how this project was kind of inspired. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, over to you, Chandra. Should we uh, go ahead with your paper and then we'll take questions after Chandra's paper. Thanks. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. This is Chandra, an assistant professor from CMR School of Architecture. I'll be presenting a project that I was working on as part of my uh, bachelor's. So this was... Um, this project was done as a thesis elective conducted by urban think tank at ETH Zurich. So, um, this is basically, uh, I mean, I'll be talking about the potential of using uh, urban simulation games as a design process. The whole objective is to perhaps address the challenges that uh, you know we have been uh, seeing through the conference and what our previous panelists were also talking about and uh, games help do that like games are basically simulations of uh, scenarios so that we can test ideas we can test uh, different strategies and perhaps we can even test some skills right so um, so in order to do that i mean uh, we all know that a city is a system or rather a system of systems. So, uh, so in order to understand the city um, or uh, perhaps what are the requirements of city or how do we uh, compare different cities? What is that quality, you know, that uh, makes one city better than the other? So, um, yeah. So, uh, Majorly, we have been looking at the structure given um, by the uh, Egan wheel, wherein, uh, I mean, here what uh, this wheel shows is that there are different categories such as, you know, every sh uh, city should have a socio-cultural aspect which is very active, it should have a governance which is fair and well run, it should have a uh, connectivity which is uh, well connected and so on. So I've just uh, sort of highlighted certain aspects that 
can be directly affected by the planning of a city and then categorized and grouped some of these uh, parameters into uh, to create what is called the urban quality index and this urban quality index is actually the main uh, game point rather like basically it's the main uh, goal of the whole game that every player will be uh, trying to work towards and uh, these are uh, you know the productivity in economy every city needs to have a thriving and equitable uh, productivity and economy then uh, urban uh, infrastructure and public services which should be adequate and well served then uh, there should be you know accessible and active social and community development and then uh, environmental sustainability which is uh, you know considerate and efficient and then the next question that was that we were asking was who are the actors of the city like there are so many actors of a city and each one of them has some or the other role to play in the city like you know they are the major components of the city so uh, sorry yeah so i've just sort of grouped um, these actors into three teams basically you know based on their common uh, goals their common roles so which are basically the citizen representatives or the citizens then the uh, industrialists and developers and financiers and then the urban authorities or the leaders so yeah before we move in so i've just quickly want to show uh, a comparison of different urban simulation games uh, that we have already so and this has been mapped based on the kind of scale that each game works with and the level of participation so if we look at uh, all these green bubbles they are basically uh, wherein the levels of participation is very less all of them are uh, digital games wherein you know you uh, you just have one player and that player sort of tries to simulate or play or test but uh, this particular game which is you know inspired by play the city by ekim tan i hope i'm pronouncing it correct so it's a board game wherein the level of participation is very high and the whole idea of a board game is that you can discuss you can debate you can you know uh, test out different ideas and you can know each other's perspectives and opinions so um, so this is where the version that i have developed lies on uh, and because this is based on the indian cities due to the scale of the indian cities uh, the game will not be going into much of a detail that is the building scale but rather it will be looking only at the city scale and uh, i'll just quickly run you through the game so and the game component so there's a board Uh, which will be pre-arranged based on some existing scenario or any existing city. So there are different components like the housing units, the industrial or the office units, uh, the hospitals, metros, railway station, parks, etc. And uh, as explained earlier, so there will be three teams: the citizen team, the urban authorities team, uh, the industrialist team, and there can. be a moderator who can be a separate entity or they can be part of any of the teams like how we do in monopoly okay and the whole idea of this game is that you propose you negotiate and you act or build the projects on to the city and see how it is affecting the urban quality index so um these are the uh, the project cards perhaps uh, wherein uh, let's say if you want to propose a housing unit every team will have certain number of tokens and this is the cost of that project and there are many projects wherein uh, you need to negotiate with the fellow team in order to build it and likewise there will be uh, Im uh, i mean implications on to the urban quality index in some of the projects uh, you can see here there are negative implications as well and there are some positive implications and uh, and uh, you can even upgrade certain projects which is trying to uh, be close to the reality uh, 
and this is like the mapping card, like you know where you map the thing. Earlier, the environmental sustainability was put up as a separate entity, but uh, when we did the test run, uh, we got a feedback that environmental sustainability is something which acts at uh, different scales, and it uh, every uh, project has a different uh, this thing. So that's why environmental sustainability has been clubbed together with each of this, so that let's say if the citizens are trying to put in some points, they should know how much did they contribute towards the environmental sustainability as compared to the authorities. So I'll just quickly run you through some of the features. One is contribution. Many of the projects you need to contribute and then only build. And the upgradations, like you can upgrade an existing project. And this upgradation could be based on different things. It could be either environmental sustainability or it could be in terms of the productivity, etc. Yeah, and there are these event cards as well, which uh, you need to draw after every five turns. So this is to bring in a factor of luck, which is very difficult to achieve uh, when we are thinking or designing. So, you know, like, and there are event cards that have positive implication and a negative implication. And every project along with the uh, its value, it also has a site value, wherein uh, whatever site you choose, uh, that uh, value depend. Uh, uh, I mean, that value affects the cost as well as the outcomes of that project. And uh, this is quickly the test run, and I'll. Uh, so some of the um, important points and observations that came while doing the test runs was that uh, uh, this whole idea of role playing actually helped uh, many understand you know, uh, the other pe person's perspective and it also helped in creating a certain sense of empathy. Like we all, you know, blame that, hey, you know, this is not working, they're not doing their job. But when they were actually role playing, they really understood that, you know, uh, why certain decisions were made. And uh, yeah, this game also helped in understanding the difference between a strategy and a tactic. Like generally when we uh, do a master plan, we are basically strategizing, but uh, it becomes very difficult to understand the tactics also. Like, you know, in order to achieve that strategy, what should be, we be doing? What is the first step that should be done? Uh, uh, then, uh, yes, uh, I mean, generally the master planning or uh, this thing is a very linear process. Mostly it is a linear process, but the game helps in understanding the uh, process as a very cyclic one and uh, yeah like some of the features like the event cards and uh, you know, like you know there were some people who were just calling in for a favor they were sort of naturally people were bribing like hey you agree to me in this turn i'll you know support you in the next turn and so on so that also introduces a factor of luck and you know unpredictability which is very difficult to address otherwise. Then, uh, yeah, uh, the actors or the teams, they were, sometimes they were playing against each other and sometimes they were playing with each other. So this also helps in understanding how teamwork and the participation was working. Um, one thing, yes, the game is still very abstract and it's like a work in process, but uh, maybe, you know, uh, uh, it could be more precise by adding in more data and more layers and perhaps using a digital platform also to bring in that accuracy. And uh, otherwise the game did help in spreading awareness. Like a lot of the students that I was playing with uh, didn't know that there were so many layers to a city and how it affected uh, different criteria. And uh, uh, there was also one very important feedback that I received was, these different layers and complexities of the city can perhaps be taken up as different levels of a game or different, there could be a version just for, let's say traffic or, you know, the way road network, which could talk about the water, water sources and the channels and so on. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would just like to conclude by saying that if not, uh, I mean, if we don't, if this cannot be uh, implemented, maybe it could be like a platform to practice or
to develop oneself or develop one's planning capabilities. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chandra. Um, you know, I, it, it takes me back to this uh, uh, point in first year architecture where somebody had told me, uh, you know, if your model doesn't work, then the building's not actually going to stand. And the role of, you know, representation in helping you understand what can work on the ground or not. Um, I was just thinking about, however, uh, you know, um, uh, does does a game like this still have impulses of a master plan in some ways, right? Like, because the master plan also has very, very, uh, these different scenarios that are built out. And um, is there a way in which we don't think about simulation as this, you know, with a capital S, but something that different heuristic devices that different communities can also use to tell planners, oh, if you played this game with us, you'll understand what we mean to say. You know, I was just wondering if it flipped in that way and what would that uh, do? Thanks. Um, we can open the floor for questions. And yeah, we'll start with you, Rohit. Hello. Yeah, hi. Thanks for this session. Uh, my question is for Lorraine. Uh, it's a couple of questions. Like, So you talked about the whole socio-spatial analysis um, approach to examine the urban periphery, the peripheral urbanization. And uh, one of the things like, I think even Namrata spoke about it. And I think uh, there's this concept of that blurring, right? There is no defined edge often. Where does the urban and rural begin? What is that boundary? And I'm just trying to understand like if this framework of peripheral urbanization beyond just the spatial understanding needs to be actually used by the policy makers, by the decision makers to think when they draw a line on the map, when they make a decision in the development regulations, how can they use this framework for decision making, this framework of peripheral urbanization, trying to understand that it is not one homogeneous way of city making, but it is multiple ways in which cities are being made, transformed, and they are, they are expanding. So that was my first part of the question. And uh, the second was on the socio-spatial analysis. So I, you talked about geosciences, right? So I believe you're using GIS mapping to also understand and layer it with the political e economic processes which are going on. So in that spatial analysis, uh, are you trying to also look at the heights? So for example, we often just go by the two-dimensional understanding of the cities. But whereas what is happening on the ground, uh, there is a very different dynamics when you see suddenly uh, places or settlements which are three story, two story versus just ground settlements. Do you think that plays any role? The height or the depth plays any role in defining how you look at peripheral urbanization? Thank you. Yeah, we'll take a couple of questions. Hi, my, my name is Ravikant. My question is for uh, Chandra, Professor Chandra. Thank you for the great presentation. It was. Can you uh, speak up a little? We, we can you hear me now? Is this better? Yeah. All right. Thank you for the great presentation. It kind of like uh, was a very interesting uh, exercise at uh, looking at how like you know structural interactivity and like how different assemblages kind of like uh, intersect with each other. But I kind of wanted to get your opinion on like how do you factor in like social dynamics into a, a, a system like that that you're kind of creating. Uh, because like uh, uh, our cities are like, you know, extremely segregated by social dynamics, especially caste, right? Uh, and like when we look at the actors in the city, like the way you've listed them, uh, like working class or merchants or even something like leaders, like uh, it kind of flattens out their identity in an occupational role. But often these are based on competing social interests, for instance, right? So uh, like, for instance, there is housing segregation, people who tend to build like luxury housing, it's often driven by a certain kind of a caste interest or so on and so forth. So uh, who has more agency within the system? And uh, like, because often there is like structural negative empathy also towards different groups, right? Like, uh, uh, you go to like, a lot of the affluent parts of the city, uh, which tend to be upper caste, there's a kind of a negative empathy about like how slum dwellers are in general in that sense. Uh, and these are also people with a lot of agency within the structural system. So how does something like that factor in? Uh, because otherwise it becomes a uh, like an exercise where we are interacting with each other, 
without possibly the most dynamic aspect of that whole planning thing. Again, great uh, uh, interest. Would just like your comments on that. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That was really interesting. I guess one of the things I was thinking about with this panel and then some of the keynote from yesterday and a few other examples is it seems like there's this really fascinating moment for sort of doing comparative work across different urban regions as you were talking about. And one of the things I'm wondering though about that is a lot of that seems to also cross across disciplines. And I'm wondering where this kind of comparative urban approach, where that's been beneficial to cross disciplines in this way. But even more importantly, where are the kinds of frictions that one experiences in doing this, kinds of, this kind of work when one is working across disciplines that have certain sort of methodological practices? And how has your experience been of encountering some of those frictions and dealing with it in doing sort of comparative urban work of this variety? Is there time for me to go anyway? Sure. Great. So my also. question is uh, for Lorraine. And I was intrigued by the connectivity bypass um, pairing and wondering, you know, connectivity to where was my main question. And because people are launching themselves into the city from other places, so well connected to those places or look, putting themselves on the, on the edge in order to access the city, I'm also struck by the bypass um, metaphor in Lingang, the connection is the bypass in the sense that this main road, that the bridge to the deep water port was meant to feed Lingang, the industrial area. In fact, it, the lorries just go straight by. And so this city is stranded now. So that, you know, that seems like a, an intriguing tension, connectivity bypass. I wondered how you deal with that. Lorraine and then Chandra. Well, thank you for those questions, those different questions. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with um, Rohit. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think we're interested in the peripheries, the urban peripheries, but we're not really interested necessarily in, in trying to contain them and say, this is where the periphery starts, this is where it ends, and that kind of speaks to your question, uh, Namata. Um, and, and so we're, we're not even looking at, you know, boundaries as much as possible. Like to start with, we're just looking at built up area and how that evolves, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but, but where I think there is uh, sort of policy relevance uh, for sure is that, you know, if, you, if you're explaining how, you know, the urban peripheries are expanding and, and qualitatively how they're, they're changing or how infrastructure uh, investments, um, the spatial implications of that, the things that are invisible, like the crowding out of certain types of employment, for instance, or, or even this thing that everybody talks about, indirect employment, you know, from, uh, like, say, um, industrial investment. There's really no study on that. There's no, uh, you know, there's very little knowledge about really how that works. And I think, you know, comparing, say, a peripheral kind of um, a process of of uh, urban development that's kind of state-led and then one that's more organic, you're going to have very different needs in terms of like services to provide and that kind of thing. So I, so I don't think it would, it would help sort of normatively say this is what, you know, you should expand your boundary this much or, you know, it'd be, I would actually be very interested in knowing what is the thinking behind decisions that say, okay, now we're going to expand by, you know, five-fold, which was the case in October. Um, you know, why? Why not four? Why not six? You know, and whatever. But um, and that kind of uh, leads to, um, I guess, this this question that was in the that was in the chat. So I mean, maybe I'll just combine that. Um, I, I think that studying these processes and studying the types of knowledge that inform, um, you know, decisions about placing investment or, or whatever, they they help reveal the norms that are driving that, and and those norms are very often very implicit. And, and so there's knowledge that's mobilized to make these decisions, but there's knowledge that's ignored and it's very often kind of experiential or community-based or you know, um, knowledge that just doesn't even come into the conversation. And you know, that's where I think planning um, really you know, could uh, provide some kind of, you, know, you, you had some really, uh, I thought, provocative ideas about how planning might be you know, 
a little more relevant. Um, but uh, this thing about interdisciplinary, um, yes, very challenging. Because again, you know, a lot of the methods that, that geosciences, you know, are using are, are, are very just very positivist and like, okay, this is our, this is, you know, these are the numbers and this is, and, and you know, the, the sort of assumptions behind the decisions about how you're going to make these polygons and how you're going, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, sort of inbuilt assumptions. And if you're not trained in those disciplines and you're collaborating, yeah, it's kind of like a little bit like a black box. And uh, so I find that challenging, but I, I think that there's also a lot that can be gained from that. Uh, and I mean, at least I hope, I mean, that's the, okay, I'll stop there, I think. Yeah. I think um, um, there was a question about addressing the social dynamics of a city. Um, I mean, that was one of the challenges and one of the points that uh, I was discussing with uh, the faculties as well, like, you know, uh, but then again, uh, that's why the introduction of a site value, like, you know, if I'm trying to build on someone else's land, like, but still, yes, it's a work in progress. I, I'm, I'll, I mean, I'll definitely take the suggestion and try to think about it. And the second is, yeah, the uh, comment on the housing types and uh, uh, categorizing the housing types rather than just calling it a housing, maybe a tiny part of it was addressed by the different scales of housing, like like the small scale of housing was like the smaller one, big scale housing, which is generally the developer societies and gated communities. Uh, the it, the uh, the point was addressed by the scale, but yes, maybe some ownership also, like you know the the communities, like how uh, we form the communities, maybe that should also be. Uh, added so yeah perhaps it's a beginning maybe you know things can get detailed out further and further yeah. sorry jenny I, I it was on another page um yeah uh so so actually we see these lenses as as yeah being there's tension between them you know fragmentation integration it's always a matter of degree and and you know how you decide to to do this and and connectivity and bypass, you know, again, there are spatial kind of ways of measuring connectivity, you know, in terms of like, say, transport or, or, or roads or whatever. Um, but, but then, you know, you can have added connectivity and that creates bypass. And, um, but we also do use bypass uh, sort of metaphorically, you know, being bypassed in decision making and, you know, communities not being um, consulted and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, and, and what, what we're saying is that by, by using a, a spatial analysis at different scales, it, it sort of teases out some of these, um, you know, some of these patterns. And, you know, we're not necessarily in the, in the Chennai project that interested in, in morphologies, but, but to do an a posteriori uh, kind of a, of a, a project, we, we started with them. We, we started with the morphologies and then we tried to backtrack, you know, what were the processes that created those? And, um, and, and so that's, that's really, that was that, that methodology. And now we're starting, you know, a priori where we're doing a, a very, you know, sort of in-depth kind of spatial analysis to steer, um, I, I think, steer us toward sites that, that will either be very different or similar and, and, then, and then go from there. We'll take a couple of questions uh, online. Uh, I think you are on to the first one. I'll go to the next. Uh, from city clay models to digital models and now simulated models, uh, where changes can be made uh, and their effect on the city can be done instantly. Has any city seriously adopted this in practice? I think this is a question for you. This one's really fascinated by you. Um, I actually Are there know. any cities that have adopted uh, simulation games of this sort? Um, I mean, definitely, uh, Ekim Tam has been working on. Mm. So she's mm. been working on for Istanbul and Amsterdam. I see. Uh, otherwise, the uh, other cities, I'm also not really sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The next one's from Aman Roy, who says, uh, "Hi, I'd like to thank the panelists for their presentations. My question is for Professor Chandra. Could you describe any instances where gaming strategies 
have been taken up for, uh, I think this is similar to what you just answered. Uh, then could you elaborate on any specific dimensions of planning, decision making, which gamification could benefit? Gamification could benefit. Is there any particular dimension? Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, one thing that the game did help in doing was uh, bringing in different insights from different people. And uh, uh, maybe I'll just share one example of an instant when we were playing around and uh, uh, I mean, suddenly because of some event card, the productivity and the community dropped. So the students just started decided, okay, let's start building temples because it was uh, affordable and they had enough number of tokens for it and we'll convert it into a temple town and you know so on so uh, those kind of things were happening but uh, yeah I mean uh, in terms of planning uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the game still needs to be balanced in terms of how much accurate it is as well as being fun and easy to understand because uh, one of the previous versions, uh, we had added just too many layers of complexity that it just took a lot of time explaining the game first. So that achieving that balance was one of the major challenges. So uh, I mean, I'm sure definitely will think about this and see how to achieve that balance. Or and I think that addresses to your question actually that who should play this game? Like, should the game be played by the common people? Should the game be played by the planners? Or, you know, should it be played by someone else? I think once that question- I was answered, actually wondering who can even stimulate, simulate the game. Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Play the game, but like, can yeah. you be a part of somebody who makes the rules for the game type, you yes, know, that way. Yes. Um, okay, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, this is for Prashant. Okay. There are different types of public transport systems uh, and the citizen would combine some of them while commuting. I'm wondering, are, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, are you going to investigate different practices across the variety of public transportation and different experiences, uh, practices from different social profiles? What, uh, what is the method? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I, I focused on trains primarily because of, of the question of scale, uh, because I, I think when, when you look at the suburban uh, train network and when you look at, uh, you know, large scale circulatory networks, uh, you see how they're a vital in these kinds of urban connectivity. And I think this uh, also relates to uh, Lorraine's work on, on peripheries and, and like these peri urban spaces uh that that have these these housing settlement the, these boom and this kind of boom in housing settlement and and what kind of pressure that has on infrastructure and so on and how that that's related to these 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 urban flows uh so it's also it's also about the the, the number the sheer number and the density of people who are traveling and that and that's one of the reasons why why i focused on on trains uh i was initially interested in in, in doing something with uh, with with Bombay's best uh, buses uh, as well, uh, but but that was harder to kind of integrate methodologically uh, because because the nature and the and and the, and, the, and the social and economic costs of breakdown are also different when when an individual bus breaks down vis a vis when a train breaks down on the tracks. So so I thought it was more connected to these to, to this question of flows and so on. Uh, but I do, I do have a lot of vignettes of, of you know, people reflecting on travel and so on. Uh, but I'm not sure how that will feed into into my main work. But but that 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 is a very interesting question. Thanks. Do we have some? Yeah. Sure. I, I was just curious if uh, it's possible if we could get a response from the question from the colleague in the back. Um, I don't know if we had a, a comment. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think we heard a response on that. Uh, are you talking about Rohit's question? From Professor Kasana, <clears throat> he had a, a comment that I think that was raised. And was I, there? I, I yeah. think the. Uh, are you talking about the question directed at Chandra? Yeah. 
Somebody, somebody had a comment uh, okay. from, from the back, and I think it was for the presentation on uh, maintenance and repair. And I was looking for the response to it, but. Uh, I think, I think, would, did anyone have a comment on maintenance and repair that they'd want to reiterate? Oh, okay. Uh, we could move on then. Uh, I just was curious about the Bhopal um, presentation and um, wondering whether if the master plan was to see the, these water bodies differently, to name them as rivers or designate them, um, how, how would that translate into making a difference? Do you think it would stop the development or lead to stronger protections of the water, the rivers, and so on. So I'm just wondering for your prognosis, you know, what could be done about the situation you described. Thank you for your question. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. So, you know, uh, Bhopal is an interesting case, um, but it's not probably, it's probably also a typical case. It's the 17th largest Indian city. It's, its population is more than 2 million. Uh, it's a capital city. It's, um, uh, Bhopalis pride them, their city, uh, pride themselves on having an exceptionally beautiful city. Uh, it's a beautiful setting. Uh, and the development plan, uh, you know, uh, development here has been, has, uh, has had a quantum leap. Uh, 50 years ago, the, the development area or the area under the city was uh, uh, jurisdiction was just 30 square kilometers. And in five decades, it's 1,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's notified, uh, intended to be notified. So to the, that jump of 30 times is a jump that uh, staggers the imagination. It's happened in many cities, uh, but I believe that Bhopal uh, has a unique... Uh, Possibility as well. It's uh, it's got, you know, it's, the development plan only speaks about two rivers, but actually we counted 63 streams, and the difference between two rivers having saying two rivers and 15 15 kilometers length and saying that you know 63 streams and 800 kilometers length is a staggering difference. So, what is it that we're not accounting for, and? Uh, so if you, if you take a step back and ask ourselves that, you know, what is it that planning is missing? I think it's missing a large part of the, uh, of the picture. We've got uh, a situation where for six months in the year, there's almost no water in the city. We've got, a, we've got the largest lakes on the subcontinent and they dry out completely every alternate year. And, uh, and I think I'm not the only one who, who's worried about what would happen if the monsoon fails two years or three years in succession, you know. Uh, we've been lucky in the last few years, monsoons haven't failed because of La Nina. But if it does, uh, we're sitting on a, on a sandstone plateau where there is no groundwater. Our groundwater our aquifers are severely depleted. So I, co I couldn't be the only one thinking about this as, as, a, as, a uniquely, uh, as a unique situation that's marked with contradictions, that's riddled with contradictions. You're sitting on a plateau and you have flooding, uh, every alternate year. Every alternate year you have droughts. So you in the same city you have floods and droughts. Uh, you know, you, half the city gets its water from tankers. Uh, this is hardly a satisfactory situation. So what is the answer? The answer is that we've just not understood our rivers. And unless we understand our rivers, we are putting huge populations at risk. And not just of the, of the city, but also downstream. Because the city doesn't know what to do with its waste. You know, to date, the installed capacity of the sewage treatment plants, and there are several, and this is a capital city, so it receives, uh, uh, you know, and it receives attention that is, uh, uh, you know, far beyond what the average city receives. We only treat 25, 30% of our sewage. So where is the sewage going? It's going to our, into our rivers, into our lakes. So uh, I hope that answers your question. I don't have a direct answer. I'm just, uh, I'm just, a, uh, I'd say, just a researcher, just looking at uh, things from curious, uh, with curiosity. 
but I do notice that there is a, a, a mismatch between uh, the green policy, between what the development plan says it wants to do, and it's um, uh, and what the science says it should be doing, or you know what, from a normative point of view, we ought to be doing, or from what the science says, uh, you know, needs to be done to be able to address these issues. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I have a quick follow-up question to that. I mean, uh, in Bhopal, so for example, in the uh, work of uh, Chitra Venkatramani talks about how uh, in Bombay there is uh, an absolute um, sort of, you know, uh, denial of rivers like Miti being an estuarine system because what they want is that a river has a proper boundary and hence it's good for uh, real estate. Estuarine systems are more complicated and, you know, they take up a larger part of land and, and they don't want Miti to be called an estuarine system, but a river. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are similarities in Bhopal as well, where it's not about uh, them, they don't want to recognize the tributary because it means giving up a certain amount of land, or is that not so much of a case? I think there are two different problems. There are two different, distinct problems. One problem is that most of our planning guidance uh, understands rivers in a way that a river simply don't, you know, the reality doesn't match up. When we think of a river, what is it that we really think? We think of Godavari or Kaveri or, you know, Ganga or Yamuna. These are perennial rivers. They carry large, large amounts of water. But my argument is that our rivers aren't like that at all. In peninsula, in, in, in central India, which is, you know, which is dry uh, for the most part. I'm not talking about the Narmada Basin. I'm talking about the highlands of central India. I'm talking about Western India, uh, all of Rajasthan, all of Gujarat, um, you know, Western Madhya Pradesh, which is much drier. Uh, our rivers simply don't behave like that. We don't have rivers that are perennial. We have rivers that are intermittent. They have intermittent flows. And, and research shows that actually intermittent rivers sometimes have much more biodiversity, have, have, a, much, have a far more complex, uh, uh, you know, ecology than uh, perennial rivers because they support diverse life forms and they support, you know, a cyclical renewal of right of life and species advance and they and they recede and so they're always in flux uh, so these rivers demonstrate flux in far different and more complex ways than perennial rivers do and that simply hasn't been taken into account uh, there is no planning guidance uh, at the national or state level that accounts for intermittent uh, rivers uh, that's my argument so uh, on the one hand the problem is uh, of planning guidance so the other other part of the problem is that the, you know the science is simply not integrated has simply not been looked at i hope that that answers the yeah, question uh, uh, we'll take just, one question yeah i just wanted to ask i mean and this is to anyone who wants to answer this but okay okay you can hear now okay uh, i just wanted to ask that political constituencies right whether it's at the ward level itself, like by, by a corporator, for example, and within a ward, he he will have or she will have a lesser, I mean, space to govern, right? Or the M, there would be the MLA which will overlap that political constituency, and then the MP will have a gate, and there might be uh, within districts, for example, there might be overlaps, or even I mean, spatiality-wise, like it has severe complications for spatiality itself. How do you see? I mean in any of your works, for example, political constituency emerging as a lens, for example, its implications for methodology, the tools maybe that you design to understand changing time, space, I mean, elements, for example. So, yeah. Because, I mean, political constituencies continue to change as well based on census. And I mean, uh, lo uh, lo uh, lower level local self government bodies continue to change uh, uh, these boundaries much frequently as compared to MLAs and MPs, for example, which is done. So delimitation per se is done much faster in local bodies. So yeah. Would you like to take this? Well, I, I'm just not quite sure that I, I understand the question. It, the changing, you know, boundaries of the local constituencies, what is I mean, what, what are their yeah. impacts? Yeah. I mean, what, what is the question? So, okay. So the political constituency will also have its implication because it's that very person. For example, even if that, 
I mean, land is a state subject in that sense, and there would be only state governments make it. Collection of taxes, for example, on that is a local body. I mean, issue. Corporators should have the capacity to do it. So, for instance, I mean, if you are planning something in that sense, uh, how does I mean political constitu constituency even feature in our imagination to understand spatial complexities, for example? And are these better? I mean, uh, I mean, like better is a very value-oriented term, but like are are these also in some ways? Uh, lenses that one can use to understand spatiality and its challenges bet like in better sense yeah, yeah okay. thank you i i mean i i definitely uh, i mean i see this more in in um, where you see uh boundaries changing like say the municipality is expanded and and so what was a grand panchayat uh becomes a ward of a municipality you know of a large city and, and so then the representation, you know, the, the proximity of the public with their political representative becomes uh, much, you know, much further away in the sense that one representative represents, you know, 100,000 people as opposed to, you know, I don't know, 5,000. Um, uh, so so that's, that, there's definitely a very strong political, you know, impact of that decision to, you know, expand the boundaries of, of a city. I do not think that, I think political calculations definitely play in terms of, you know, uh, how, how a ruling party, you know, expects to be able to control that, that area. But, but I don't think that, um, you know, local politicians would at all be consulted in any way um, about these decisions. I think, I think it would be, you know, state governments play very, uh, large, uh, looming uh, roles over over cities, much more so than than actual, you know, local government. I don't know if that answers your question, really. We are out of time, but I'll just take that last question online. Uh, gamification of planning process and likewise of many other community-related processes like transport, water supply, air quality is the future. I wish planning authorities adopt uh, it at smaller scales to begin with. There's no escape from uh, creating a metaverse for the real world. Uh, I think that's a, a comment. It's not really a question. So, um, yeah. OK. OK, thank Fine. you. Sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry, Rohit. I forgot you had a second question about height. You know, I do think that there are, um, you know, techniques through remote sensing to be able to you know, uh, measure height of buildings. Um, and I'm not absolutely sure about that, but I, I think what, to, to your question, whether, whether that's important, that knowledge, definitely, because of the, the resources that you need. I mean, if it's a five-story building or a, a 16-story building, you know, the water and then also, of course, the solid waste that, that gets generated and, and all of these questions. And, you know, I, I pointed out that there was these, these village panchayats where we're doing kind of some in-depth work to figure out, you know, their local finances. And, and when a, a housing uh, complex comes up, I mean, it, that, that one complex generates more garbage than the entire village, right? And, and so that raises a lot of questions of who, who pays and, you know. Um, and, and to your uh, remark, which is very good about peripheries, I mean, the boundary, I mean, the, the sort of notion of a periphery, the concept, I think never disappears because it just, you know, it moves. It's not the same space that's, that's, uh, that it refers to, but, but because, it's, because it's conceptual, whenever you have an edge, you, you know, you have an inside and outside, you have a, you know, but, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone. I think we'll end the session now um, and uh, prepare for the next one. Thank you.